we are going to start making the cross transmission to the Institute of Legal. We are going to start making the cross transmission to the Institute of Legal. Okay, we are on time to start this presentation. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Elena Centeno, I'm the director of the office of UNAM uh, in Tucson at the University of Arizona. UNAM Tucson Centro de Estudios Mexicanos, the Institute of Legal Research of UNAM, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences of the University of Arizona, and the UASBS Mexico Initiatives, welcomes you to the presentation of the book The Necropolitical Production and Management of Forced Migration by Ariadna Esteves. We are very happy and very glad to have the opportunity and this space to make a presentation of such an important work. I also is, um, I'm introducing, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Aletia Fernandez de la Reguera, who will be leading this presentation. She is a researcher at the Institute of Legal Research of UNAM and the coordinator of the National Diversities Laboratory. She specializes in gender and migration and gender violence and autonomy of women. Thank you, Aletia, for uh, taking the time of organizing this with all the other participants. And uh, thanks for um, having such a great collaboration with the University of Arizona and with UNAM Tucson. Uh, throughout a lot of different activities that we've been uh, doing together regarding gender and other uh, important topics such as migration, which is a, a very important uh, topic that we will be talking about today. So I leave the Zoom to you and thanks uh, for being with us. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, important event for us, a presentation of Ariadna Sestere's book, Necropolitical Production and Management of Forced Migration. Um, I have the pleasure to conduct this event to the event today. And um, first, I would like to uh, thanks Unam Tucson, particularly Dr. Elena Centeno and uh, Dr. Arnoldo Bautista for their support hosting this event. Also, um, to, uh, I'm very grateful uh, to the UNAM University of Arizona Consortium on Migration, Human Rights and Human Security. Of course, to the Institute of Legal Studies, the uh, University of Arizona SBS Mexico Initiative, particularly to Luis Coronado, who is always supporting these activities. And also Sudimer, that is the University Seminar of Internal Displacement, Migration, Excel, and Reputation at UNAM, and the National Laboratory on Diversities at UNAM, as well as CISAN UNAM. As you can see, many different institutions and entities are involved in this presentation. We wanted to have a binational presentation, not only because um, the author, uh, he published this book, in English, but because the book talks about regional and global perspectives on migration and on the uh, necro power. We will have the time to discuss and to give our comments, but first I wanted to really thank all the uh, entities and the institutions involved in the organization. Um, our program today, we have a great panel. We have uh, four commenters um, and I will, I mean, I prefer to introduce them first and then we can start uh, giving our comments and also having this dialogue with the author. We are very pleased to have Ariadne Steves with us here. Um, so uh, I'll give just a very short introduction of Ariadne Steves, Bill Simmons, Dan Martinez. Thank you, Elena, because you already introduced um, uh, what I do and why am I here commenting on this book. So uh, Ariadne Steves, she's the author of, of, the, of the book. She's a tenured research professor at the Center for Research on North America, CISAN, at UNAM. 
She holds a PhD in international relations at Sussex University in the UK. She teaches a course at Necropolitical Apparatus of Forced Migration and Research Seminar on Biopolitics and Necropolitics at UNAM's Faculty of Political and Social Sciences. She is co-coordinator of the Research in Progress Seminar on Critical Legal Studies and Migration at UNAM's Institute of Legal Research. She is the author of this book, The Necropolitical Production and Management of Forced Migration, which was published um, this year by Lexington Books. Also the book, Necropower in North America, The Legal Specialization of Disposability and Lucrative Death, uh, published by Pelgrave Macmillan last year, and Guerras Necropolíticas y Biopolítica de Asilo en América del Norte. Um, thank you, Ariadna, for um, commenting the book and discussing all the, the, experiences, the experiences you have through this publication with us. And um, now will I introduce uh, Bill Simmons. Bill, he's a, a very good colleague, and thank you, Bill, for being with us today. He's professor of gender and women's studies and director of the Online Human Rights Practice Graduate Program at the University of Arizona. His research is highly interdisciplinary, using theoretical, legal, and empirical approaches to advance human rights for marginalized populations around the globe. His books include Joyful Human Rights, Human Rights Law and the Marginalized Other, and Anarchy and Justice, an introduction to Emmanuel Levinas' political thought. Simmons is currently working on a project in Niger, Nigeria and Mozambique to empower people affected by leprosy using international human rights documents. He has also started working with two former MA students and several other colleagues on a participatory project in Bangladesh. He's also exploring possible research projects on comparative immigration between West Africa, Europe, and Mexico US corridors. Um, thank you, Bill. And now I'll introduce Dan Martinez. Dan, he, uh, his research and teaching interests include race and ethnicity, unauthorized immigration and criminology. He is particularly interested in the social and legal criminalization of unauthorized migration. Dan Martinez has also conducted extensive research on deportations and undocumented border crosser deaths along the US-Mexico border. He is a principal investigator of the Migrant Border Crossing Study, a four foundation funded research project that examines recently deported unauthorized migrants' experiences crossing the US-Mexico border and residing in the US. His current research focuses on Latino panethnicity, the relationship between so-called sanctuary policies and city level crime rates, and the ecological correlates of officer-involved shootings and violent crime in southwestern cities. Dan Martinez is an affiliate of the Mexican American Studies Department, the School of Geography and Development, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the SBS Human Rights Practice Program. He currently serves on the editorial boards of the American Sociological Review and the Journal of Migration and Human Security. Uh, so thank you all for being with us. And um, what we will have is a round of 15 minutes. First, we will start with the comments by Bill Simmons. Then it will be my turn to comment on Ariadna's book. Then we'll have Dan Martinez. And finally, we'll have the author, Ariadna, to um, uh, give us feedback on all our comments. And also, after Ariadna's intervention, we will have uh, times for questions and answers with all our audience. Thank you for following us. And you can send your comments, your questions via chat for the people who are connected in this Zoom, but also for the ones who are following us through Facebook Live. So thank you so much. And Bill Simmons, the floor is yours. You are muted, Bill. Can you open your mic? No, uh, Arnold, I don't know if someone can help us. Maybe he's muted. Okay, very good. It looks like I wasn't made co-host, so. Um, Thank you, Bill. Okay, and, and I'm still not able to share my screen. I, I don't know why that is. No, 
now I th uh, we will start seeing your screen. Okay, great. I'll let you know. Yeah, now we can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and then, and thank you very much, Lathia, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Ariadna, for all the work you've been doing. I, it's a great honor to be here to talk about your work. I followed it for years. And um, congratulations on the new book uh, from Lexington. Uh, it is really an important contribution. Um, and then finally, thanks for to the organizers, to UNAM, to UNAM Tucson, and to all the other organizers uh, for putting this together. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, two things today. I'm going to briefly talk about Ariadna's theoretical contributions, um, and and I can't do it justice in a handful of minutes. Um, it is really uh, a, a textbook lesson on how to. Uh, approach uh, theoretical literature, bring it together and offer new insights. And then I'm going to apply them to a new context that uh, is only briefly mentioned once in the book, and that's the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. I, I just returned from Bangladesh for a three week uh, research trip. And so it's kind of fresh in my mind. So it was the easy way for me to make a presentation. Um, the, the problem that I see that, Mar that Ariadna is, is addressing is uh, I, I think, I mean, this is the background and I think this is the background almost all of us are working in is that there, we are in the unprecedented wave of forced migration. Uh, and in the next 30 years, it's gonna get much, much worse. So if you don't like the way things are now, wait till you see what this looks like in 2050 uh, with climate change, conflict, um, with uh, COVID and, and other things. Um, Clearly, the current theoretical models of <clears throat> understanding forced migration are not sufficient. They just don't make, they just don't uh, explain as much as they need to. But there have been really important critical theoretical advances uh, in, a, in a wide range of fields. Um, uh, however, they're rarely brought together in conversation to each other. And that's what I see Ariadna doing in this book. Um, so she creates a tapestry of, of these theoretical writings. Uh, which, as I said, is really an important contribution on its own. Her regional focus is North America, uh, but not exclusively. Um, she has wonderful case studies on Honduras, Mexico, and Venezuela, but also she really uh, taps into this wonderful burgeoning literature on uh, migration in Europe. Uh, some wonderful theoretical work is being done there. Uh, and, and she argues, as the book title will tell you, that forced migration is produced and managed. It's not something that just happened one day that people decided to leave, that this some, something has produced this and it is being managed in a way that it doesn't have to be managed in that way. So, so Ariadna uh, tries to um, do some radical theorizing, getting to the root of the problem. And she, um, sees forced migration as coming from necropolitical governmentality, um, which is kind of a uh, neologism from Achille Mbembe's work. Um, and so that we often say that forced migration comes from economics or from environment or criminal violence, sexual violence or cultural conflict. But actually uh, beyond that, um, be, be, there is actually something going on um, deeper than that, and that is this necropolitical governmentality. And you can see this, um, <clears throat> and we see this in Arizona all the time, right? Um, that what, what's happened with forced migration is it's created these uh, death worlds, uh, this wonderful phrase uh, where lives are disposable, people are let to die. Um, there's em elimination of healthcare that, that forces people to die. Uh, social death we see in the U.S. and secure communities and other things. And um, this wonderful phrase that Jenny Sturmer uses, which is corpse politics. Um, this is not biopower uh, in Foucault's sense of um, the regulation of life. This is the active production of death uh, connected to forced migration. But Ariana then says that yeah, Mbembe and people who use his work uh, are right that this is necropolitical, but it's beyond that, uh, that we need to even go deeper. And she brings in two main analyses. One is a neo-Marxist analysis asking who is 
who is profiting from the disposability of migrants. Uh, and this is critical. And it's something we see in Arizona all the time with the detention facilities being privatized, healthcare for migrants being privatized, the uh, border security being privatized, et cetera. Um, and so making migrants die is functional and lucrative. Um, and she's gonna use a phrase, lucrative necropolitics, which is a very scary phrase by itself. And then she also brings in a post-colonial analysis why are some in the position to make these decisions of who is disposable? And ultimately that's an historical question. That's a question of people in the global North. There's, there's a reason why people in the global North make these decisions and they're applied in the global South in certain ways. Ariadna, and I, I'm going through this fairly quickly, it's a theoretical piece, um, partly because even if I went through slowly, I don't think I could suggest this to her work. Um, but she builds off Foucault. Um, so many in the migrant scholarship um, rely on Foucault for his concept of biopower, the regulation of life. Um, but that's not where she's going with Foucault. She relies on his um, terms, governmentality and apparatuses, uh, that um, there's a governance structure that regulates migration and regulates all aspects of migrants' lives. And there's various apparatuses that are used to advance that governmentality. And she distinguishes the first world, uh, which she calls the rule of law necropower, which is technology, corporations, uh, law, interest groups, et cetera, are all part, are all apparatuses advancing the governance of migration. In the third world, this expands to things like drug cartels, assassins, extraction industries, death squads, policing, repression of free speech, et cetera. And these are the first world and third world are clearly connected in this production and management of migration uh, through extraction industries, securitization industries, including the exporting of securitization. And I would add climate change is a clear way that the first world and third world um, necropolitics are connected. So to summarize, and, and this is just the title of her book, is that migration ne necropolitics is produced, and then as I'll say on the next slide, it's also managed. Um, in the production uh, is where we, um, uh, where there's an attempt to depopulate deliberately resource-rich geographies by either killing or displacing people, right? Um, this, this happens uh, throughout the Americas, and as I'll show, this is also something that happens with the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, and that the um, corporations, this, is, this governance is, is a connection between government, corporations, criminals. They are able to terrorize people and destroy communities while devastating the environment. And micro, migrant necropolitics is managed. It's managed in third world countries, but it's more so managed um, at, at the borders of first world countries and within. Um, the, um, the very category of migrant, refugee, asylum seekers is fragmented. It is used, it is uh, deployed uh, for the purpose of governmentality. Um, and those who make it to the North and who get through the labyrinth of asylum policies, live in pockets of disposability, right? Where they are able, they, they can be depopulated and uh, they are um, victims of lucrative death again. And we can think of Operation Streamline here in Tucson, you know, which is really a corporatized way of um, dealing with migrants and uh, uh, dealing with the prosecution of migrants. So from that very brief summary uh, of her theoretical advances, I'm gonna to try to apply it to the Rohingya refugee crisis in the context in Bangladesh. And I'll try to do this quickly. Um, I'll introduce the context uh, quickly. Um, so as you may know, um, between 20, in 2017 and 2018, approximately a million migrants, were, a million Rohingya were forced to flee from Myanmar into Bangladesh. 
Uh, they, they left the uh, Rakhine state, which is that pinkish red area, and they settled in Cox's Bazaar in what is now the world's largest refugee camp. Before 2017, before the genocide and ethnic cleansing, they were considered the most persecuted minority on earth. Uh, they were stripped of uh, citizenship in 1982. Uh, Rohingya were very much uh, victims of biopower. Uh, their lives were regulated in all fashion. Uh, they could not get married without permission. They could not, uh, childbirth was regulated. Uh, their movement was regulated, et cetera. Um, in addition, they were subject to uh, numerous instances of pogroms or communal violence. Um, and so many of the Rohingya have been living in internally displaced camp, camps. And then with rising Buddhist nationalism and cyclones, um, the Rohingya were, were suffering greatly uh, by 2017. And 2017 is the, what the UN originally called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. U.S. government is now labeled it a genocide. You can see this village, which no longer exists. Uh, they've been wiped off the face of the earth. Um, thousands were killed, widespread sexual violence, villages burned to the ground, uh, incredible uh, atrocities, and at least 700,000 fled to Bangladesh. This is an aerial view of the refugee camp. Uh, this is a picture of a fire from two years ago that burned down two main sections of the camp, killing dozens of people. It is a massive complex. Life in the uh, makeshift camps is really bare life, uh, using uh, Agamben's phrase. Um, the camps have made the stateless even more stateless. The camps are now surrounded by barbed wire. There's overcrowding. They're not allowed to have jobs. Uh, the, the Rohingya have no formal education. Uh, over half are people under the age of 18. And so you have a lost generation who is not allowed to get education. The dominant narrative is that this was an ethnic cleansing of Buddhists attacking Muslims. The Rohingya Muslims were being attacked by the Burmese. Uh, that the Bamar national or ethnicity was attacking the Rohingya ethnicity or that we talk about um, an evil military regime of Myanmar uh, was attacking um, uh, the Rohingyas uh, to, to displace them. This is um, very much, you know, this is textbook genocide. This is, you know, how we, we look at genocide human rights discourses. However, uh, with my colleague, Saleh Ahmed, uh, who's up at Boise State University, We've been doing research on uh, the, what we see as the real causes behind the genocide. And it really resonates with uh, Ariadna's work um, is that the genocide was really economic to its core. Um, that the Rohingya are in, in the way of the biggest um, economic projects uh, in the world today. Uh, the Rakhine state is the linchpin for the Belt and Road Initiative from China. Uh, the Rohingya uh, were, they needed their land. Uh, and so in 2012, a law was passed in Myanmar that uh, took away peasants' land and gave it to the military. That land is now being used by China and India for major economic powers or a, a, a major economic projects. This is definitely necropolitical capitalism uh, in the production of forced migration, race and religion were mobilized for neo-capitalist uh, reasons that the, ethnic, the, the government and the Chinese and the Indian uh, 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 entrepreneurs used race and religion as a uh, way to mobilize people to get economic mean or to get their economic ends. Um, there were neoliberal apparatuses, a whole system of governmentality and the Rohingya deaths are, in, in Ariadna's phrase, lucrative deaths or lucrative social deaths. The camps are managed um, as a necropolitical system. They are states of exception. Uh, the Rohingya are left to die. Um, it is a pocket of disposability, as, as she would say. Um, 
And then the, the Bangladeshi government has refused to call these people refugees or asylum seekers. Instead, they're called forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals, FDMNSs, which means they don't have to be given any refugee protection. Um, and this, I think, the, the camps are what you would call the legal spatialization through lucrative death. In the um, interest of time, I'll just uh, make two more points. One is that we've observed some resistance to necropolitics, um, that not all governments and not all actors have um, been following the script of necropolitics. The Bangladeshi government welcomed the million refugees in 2017 and 2018. Um, uh, there's all kinds of stories as to why that happened. Um, the Rohingya have been fairly successful in the claiming of rights uh, in the nomosphere, uh, especially in the World Court and the International Criminal Court. Uh, and then we've also seen a Rohingya uh, cultural renaissance where we're seeing Rohingya subjectivity uh, because they've been displaced. And it's a very scary thought to think that without the genocide, the Rohingya cultural renaissance would not have happened. And then we have um, uh, pushback in Myanmar itself uh, with the civil war that's going on right now. And I'll end with some provocations for Ariadna. Uh, first of all, it's not a very optimistic book. Uh, we are enmeshed in a system that is almost all encompassing and there's very few cracks in which we can push back on this system. Um, I would suggest she also look at, I mean, she's already looking at about 20 different literatures. I don't know if she needs to look at another literature, but if she does, uh, the stuff on critical humanitarian studies, it's really interesting um, where migrants are uh, rewarded if they're resilient subjects. Um, they cannot demand political subject subjectification. They must be passive, resilient, entrepreneurial refugees. Um, you can't de demand property or land, uh, but as long as you're running a small shop, as long as you're, you know, trying to improve yourself and you're not, you know, you're pretty passive, you're, you're, you can be rewarded. I, I wonder about the extent of the cultural renaissance for the Rohingya, and is this what um, uh, Eliot calls forceful hope, um, or is this actually, you know, actually a real uh, place of hope? Uh, for the future. And then my biggest worry is what happens in, in when lucrative death is no longer lucrative? What happens because right now the Rohingya migrants are stuck in a camp, they're no longer, they're beyond commodification. And so if you're beyond commodification, then the necropolitical system uh, doesn't need you anymore. And so what, what becomes of a million plus people? who are in the refugee camps now, if they're not of use uh, to the system that, that, that creates and manages uh, forced migration. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so we'll have time after the three presentations to discuss some of this very, very interesting presentation and, and how you, you explain what you um, just saw in your field work in Bangladesh. Um, now it will be my turn to comment on Ariadna. And I believe a good book is good when it raises new questions. And in my case, such as with you, Bill, reading Ariadna helped me to reorganize and to enrich my analytical framework, just as what you did with Bangladesh, in my case, with um, forced migrants coming from Honduras to Mexico. Uh, I don't. I will not discuss particularly the case of Honduras. Actually, what I, I have are some comments and first, like so, a kind of review of the of some of the most um, significant concepts of the book, um, and then maybe I have time to just comment on how the book and some of this theoretical uh, uh, framework that she gives us helped me to rethink some of my categories. Um, Ariadna's book uh, condenses clearly her three main areas of interest on which she has been working for more than two decades. Ariadna, she um, is an internationalist and she's very passionate and, uh, and has worked a lot on human rights, but also on necropolitics 
and on asylum regimes. Um, from a critical perspective, um, and with this background on international relation, she has written a dense book of great theoretical and analy an analytical richness for those who study forced migration, human rights, development and extractivism, environmental degradation, not only Latin America, but um, in the world. The, the book analyzes the case, I mean, she is more focused on uh, the case of Mexico, Venezuela, Honduras, and the, the Latin American region and the corridor with the US. But just as we saw in the last presentation, it's also focused and gives a lot of examples that are happening around the world to show that global discourse of criminalization of, of migrants no? and, the, and, and asylum regimes around the world. Um, so I think that this, this analysis allows us to recognize, as I said, the global discourses and practices of criminalization of the other, the dispossessed, the uprooted, and those who have lost everything and whose only hopes lies in the mobility. But as just Bill said, it's not a very optimistic uh, book in terms of, it does not only explain the, from a post-colonial perspective, that the context of, um, of, of origin, but also very powerful concepts that Ariana brings up with this book. And one is a lucrative death that uh, drags these, these, these migrants are actually in a mobility that drags them to a slow and lucrative death that is in hands of state and non-state actors along the migration routes. Some of the questions that for me are very important in the book and um, actually um, make me connect the, the, this, this book with my own experience is different from Ariadna because Ariadna is internationalist. She's giving macro explanations and we complement very well because I'm doing like micro sociology, but in some way we are very much connecting with some of the same, the same questions. One of the theses of the book is that forced migrants do not just happen to be migrants one day. This phrase is in the, in the introduction and Ariadna is asking and trying to answer these questions along the book, how life becomes impossible in communities of origin, who is responsible, how states delegate domination technologies to criminal gangs for population control in the most extreme forms of violence, how law instrumentalizes norms and legal categories. This book is also very useful for scholars of law, for students of international law, because he's very critical about um, legal categories and the, the, how, how the asylum regimes around the world are operating. Also, she asked how legal formalisms allow for the establishment or permanent, permanent irregular spaces. How does a structural impunity informs human rights violations? And finally, what's the responsibility of the global north? in the forced migration patterns along the region and how they keep closing legal, legal paths for asylum seekers. So it's, it's actually, I mean, the, there are many different disciplines that could be engaged in the discussion. Uh, what she's analyzing is the apparatus of necropolitical production and management of forced migration and how rich countries extract natural resources and have a direct impact on economies and on criminal violence growth, and at the same time, criminalize forced migrants closing borders, also using externalization of, of border control, just as in the case of the US and Mexico. And uh, for me, one of the most shocking questions is how that becomes lucrative in forced migration process in a context of resource exploita exploitation and criminal violence. Actually, we, uh, I mean, it is, uh, we know with the people that we conduct field work, we are researchers and we are, we usually are doing field work in, in, bo in, in border areas. We know that a migrant arrives with nothing else but what is uh, with their clothes, but they are so lucrative for many different agents because they are kidnapped. It's not only the organized crime, but it's also the authorities. So there are very interesting uh, data in this book of, I mean, in terms of quantitative uh, um, uh, benefits and the different actors 
that actually can benefit from these very slow deaths that maybe they start crossing, for example, the Darien jungle, that is a very like it's it's a it's a it's a, one of the most dangerous places to cross the, the Latin American region. And the different military and non-military actors are along the Darien, but then they arrive to Mexico and they have to face the institutionalized violence, but also the gangs that are in the in the transit routes, and then they arrive to the US and all the different processes of um, of uh, this lucrative and slow death. So for me, that was something that helped me very much to analyze the process that I've been studying in the Latin, in the Mexican um, region, and particularly people from Honduras in Mexico. Now, the book is very important also in terms of um, to, to explain necropolitics. It is a state of art, actually. I mean. Ariadna provides a state of art of biopolitics of Foucault, and I will uh, just mention some of key concepts that Ariadna is explaining. So it is also great that that, that first chapter because she is giving us a clear uh, and a very um, yeah like a very complex state of art to understand what's biopolitics and necropolitics and why are these two theories very important to now analyze forced migration. So um, she's giving us a very interesting insight on concepts just as uh, apparatus or dispositives, government, governmentality, biopower. Also, she uh, eh, eh, take us to, to understand members reading on Foucault and how from this perspective in a very different context, eh, necropolitics is now giving us a new, a new way to understand the complexity of all these situations that are posed in this book is a book that is important to understand, for example, the effects of militarization, the current effects of militarization in migration routes in Mexico. It's also a very important book to understand climate change migration in the region, not only Latin America, but I think this is something, Ariadna, that you are emphasizing that relationship between extractivism, environment degradation, criminal violence and how this is not only the context of, 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 of origin, but also what's the, the, the relationship between the global north creating this context and also avoiding the responsibility in terms of international law uh, for refugees. She emphasizes that the relevance of analyzing all of these um, elements that I've been mentioning from a historical perspective. And I think this is also something important um, that, that she's uh, providing with, with, with this book. This historical and post-colonial analysis of asylum discourses, asylum structures and institutions around the globe, and how the current post-colonial system operates. Um, there are many things to say, but I don't have much time. So I also uh, would like to uh, enhance like two of the main uh, concepts of the book that is about forced depopulation and lucrative death. I think I already explained a bit about lucrative death, but Ariadna is not talking only about migrants in, in transit, but also about lucrative death along this continuum of violence that starts in the country of origin and ends up in the country of destination. And she's talking about forced disappearance. She's talking about massacres. She's talking about femicide as technologies of death. Um, she gives the example of Venezuela, Mexico, and uh, Honduras, each case with very particular context. And in the case of Venezuela, it's very interesting because she uh, explains the impact of a uh, mining industry, um, legal and illegal mining industry, and how uh, it is related to the, um, the diaspora of Venezuelans, also along with the authoritarian political crisis in this country. And in contrast, she presents a case of Honduras that is very much linked. I mean, a, a criminal violence is linked to a environmental degradation and something that is very not, that is not well uh, understood because there are many studies that talk about the dry corridor in Honduras and the environmental crisis as a, 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 a cause of migration and other 
sort of studies that are actually analyzing only like structural and criminal violence in Honduras. And with this explanation, Ariadna is trying to link together environmental processes with criminal violence and with this very strong critique to asylum regimes, because we don't still have a name, uh, sorry, a way to name as um, climate refugees and to provide comprehensive protection. Ariadna is very critical on why and how asylum is the only legal, the only category for a legal path uh, for asylum seekers. And she's critical about how other social legal categories for migration are being emphasized, such, such as forced migrants, or what the great example of what Bill was explaining, the forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals, and how categories are being created to avoid the responsibility of countries to actually comply with their obligations to provide international protection. And they are priorizing what Ariana is very well explaining in this book, the pro morituri asylum laws. In the last chapter, Ariadna is explaining why and, and, and how international mechanisms, international law mechanisms, conventions are actually providing a way to, uh, for the national legal frameworks to reinterpret law or to make laws in less favorable standards for, for to protect people. Uh, what is very like contradictory because there is a discourse that international law is actually promoting the pro persona principles and actually uh, Ariadna is emphasizing this is not about pro persona or the best interest of, of asylum seekers, but laws and the interpretation of laws are actually working through the uh, principle of pro morituri, that is to interpret law in the less favorable legal standards for asylum seekers. I think I need to stop here. There are many other things that I would like to, to, to say about the book. I really enjoy reading this book. I enjoy sharing the book with my students. I think it is quite complex for uh, migration students of, of migration studies to try to link what's happening in the, the global south to the impacts and the, the policies from the global north. So for me, this book was very useful to make them think and, and to raise new questions on the relationship of uh, these um, uh, economies of death that uh, 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 Ariadna is calling and, the, and how the, um, necropolog the necropolitical subject um, is obliged to transit through these deadly zones around the globe. This is not only the case of Mexico, as I said, Ariadna is explaining global patterns. And I just want to thank you for, for the book. And I also um, give the, the floor to Dan so he can comment and maybe uh, afterwards we can continue the dialogue, Ariadna. Thank you so much. And uh, Dan, this is now your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Martinez, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Sociology and a co-director of the Binational Migration Institute at the University of Arizona. So before uh, offering my remarks, I'd like to just take a moment to thank, thank Dr. Fernandez, CISAN, UNAM Mexico, SBS Mexico Initiatives, and others for the inv invitation to comment on Dr. Estevez's book and to pose a few questions. So I've actually set a timer for myself here, so I apologize if you hear that. Uh, go off, but I want to make sure that I do not go over. Uh, so Dr. Stevis's theoretical framework, which she describes as a Mexican post-colonial framework, places structure, particularly structures aim at producing profit, whether legal or not, through what she terms forced depopulation and lucrative death, within the broader discussion of necropower and necropolitics. So highlighting the role that these specific generating structures play in forced migration and connecting them back to necropower and necropolitics, in my opinion, is an important contribution of this book. So clearly, this framework and Dr. Estevez's discussion of Eliot's forcible hope leading forced migrants to become disposable subjects of necropolitics has notable implications for how we theorize and examine internally as well as internationally displaced persons, as well as areas of studies such as, for instance, increased border militarization, the immigration industrial complex, for-profit immigrant detention facilities, 
and in the case of my own work, uh, punitive immigration policies, mass deportation, and migrant deaths along the US-Mexico border. In this sense, the book has given me a lot to think about in terms of how I approach my research, so I'd like to thank Dr. Estevez for, for that. In the few minutes that I have, I really want to hone in on two notable areas of research where I think we can continue to draw and build upon Dr. Estevez's approach, which she actually discusses in the book. First is the U.S.'s recent effort to impede the asylum process, and second is the forced and intentional deportation of Mexican immigrants to regions along the border severely affected by the drug war. Again, I was happy to see Dr. Estevez discuss these in her book, and I would encourage scholars uh, working in these areas to really consider drawing upon her theoretical framework. So first, let's talk about the U.S.'s recent effort to limit as the asylum system or access to the asylum system. As I'm sure many of you know, all persons have a legal right uh, to seek asylum under U.S. law and various international agreements. Nevertheless, the U.S. has made a concerted effort to under undermine the asylum process or, in Dr. Estes' words, has created, quote, notable obstacles to asylum, unquote. Dr. Estes gives the example of metering along the U.S.-Mexico border in which asylum seekers have been forced to join long informal queues before even being able to request asylum and conduct a credible fear interview at a U.S. port of entry. The Migrant Protection Protocols, known colloquially as Remain in Mexico Policy, is another example discussed by Dr. Estevez in, in, uh, in her book, right? Under Remain in Mexico, rather than enjoying family members in the interior U.S., asylum seekers have been forced to await their immigration hearings near Mexico's northern border without fully knowing when or where their hearing might be. Title 42 expulsions, which were re-implemented under the guise of curtailing the spread of COVID-19, are the most recent example of the U.S.'s effort to undermine uh, asylum. Under Title 42, many asylum seekers are apprehended by U.S. authorities and simply return to Mexico or their countries of origin without having a chance to initiate the asylum process. Ultimately, the case of metering, remain in Mexico, and Title 42 expulsions uh, really is, is a case of, of deterrence through, through a, you know, really seems that deterrence through attrition seems to be the U.S. government's primary goal here, right? So rather than outright denying asylum cases or claims, the state has made an effort to grossly impede access to the asylum system to the point where asylum seekers abandon all hope, thereby exacerbating their status as disposable subjects of neopolitics, right? And to me, these are clear examples of the U.S. wielding necropower, engaging in necropolitics, and creating pockets of disposability along Mexico's northern border. Now, asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, affected by these aforementioned apparatuses and technologies of necropower, oftentimes find themselves just as far from their communities of origin as their desired destinations in the United States. And as such, due to mounting social and economic pressures, they might forego the asylum process, uh, thereby being forced to cross the U.S.-Mexico border without documentation, uh, ultimately increasing their risk of exploitation by human smugglers, uh, risk of victimization by various state actors and non-state actors, as well as the risk of death while undertaking uh, dangerous and lengthy crossing attempts through some of the most remote areas of the border, borderlands, essentially to, to, uh, as a means to avoid detection by U.S. authorities. In many cases, they do in fact die in the process, right? In fact, in the two years since the re-implementation of 42, Title 42 expulsions, we've seen a record number of border crosser deaths here in Southern Arizona. And I don't think this is a coincidence. Finally, I'd like to offer one, uh, one other case or example of where I see notable utility in Dr. Estes' framework. So last year, uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeremy Slack and I published an article in the Annals of the American Association of Geographers where we call attention to the geographies to which Mexican deportees are repatriated. Specifically, we identified what we call an apprehension repatriation mismatch between Border Patrol apprehensions in South Texas and repatriations to for instance, Tamaulipas and Coahuila, between specifically uh, 19, uh, 2009 and 2014. That is, more people were being repatriated to Tamaulipas and Coahuila than were being apprehended in adjacent border patrol sectors during this period. Now, there's several factors that cause repatriations uh, to Mexico to effectively outpace border patrol apprehensions on the corresponding uh, side of the border. However, regardless of the mechanisms at play, one thing is clear. This mismatch occurred in uh, one of the most consistently dangerous regions on, along the U.S.-Mexico border. At the time, this was period 2009 to 2014, northeastern Mexico was experiencing particularly high levels of violence, and this conflict actually intensified after the massacre of 72 forced migrants in Tamaulipas in 2010. These unprecedented levels of violence captured uh, headlines 
and media outlets across the United States and were clearly on officials' radar as documents obtained by uh, the National Security Archives in Washington, D.C. indicate. Yet deportations to this, this region escalated during this time. So Dr. Slack and I contend that this period is particularly relevant to more recent policies aimed at keeping asylum seekers in Mexico because it demonstrates how collateral aspects of enforcement tend to become increasingly central and integral to these practices over time. That is, we argue that while incidental exposure to violence and crime post-deportation may have begun as an implicit aspect of immigration enforcement, it has now morphed into one of the central tenets of current policy. And I think we can clearly see this playing out in cases of metering, MPP, and Title 42 expulsions. Now, our analyses also found that a much larger proportion of immigrants processed and deported through uh, prison and jail check, check programs, such as the quote-unquote criminal alien program, were in fact being repatriated to Chihuahua, Tamaulipas, and Baja California, uh, where, as we know, there's a notable organized crime presence. In fact, many of our respondents expressed fear that their experiences and associations in U.S. prisons would make them targets upon deportation. And some were indeed victimized, kidnapped, and harassed or shook down by state and non-state actors after being deported. In short, we argue that processes of criminalization in the U.S. context have led to a system that prioritizes punishments for migrants, particularly among those who have uh, experiences with the prison system. Once again, I believe that the apparatus of forced migration, necropolitical production and management, as articulated in Dr. Estevez's theoretical framework, lends itself to this case of deportation to dangerous geographies. So with that said, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Estevez for her important contribution. I do have a few questions that I'd like to pose, but in the interest of time, I think I'll go ahead and save them for the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um... So I'll give the, the floor to Ariadna, but just before that, I just want to remind you that you can send us your comments, you can send your questions through the chat. Um, and after Ariadna's intervention, we have time for Q&A. Thank you so much. Ariadna, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, thank you very much, Bill, Alethia, and Daniel for your comments, taking uh, taking time to read and and give comments on on my work very insightful and really uh, exciting questions and, and comments thank you so much for that so let me just um, comment on some of the issues that um, seem to be shared by you three um, first I found really really interesting how you linked the this framework I develop in the book to the cases of the Rohingyans and Honduras and the Mexico US border. In fact, Daniel, I started to think this uh, by researching and examining the these things you were talking about, but in the context of Chihuahua and uh, and uh, Texas in 2010 or, or, or so. So it's it's very similar to what you, you're talking about, what's going on now. It, it, it was happening by the time I started to, to do this book. And this book started as, um, um, well, Lexington asked me to develop a, an article I wrote to develop it into a book. So uh, I started by analyzing in North America, but then I had to go, uh, you know, globally in order to analyze and, and come up with a framework that could be, um, well, not generalized, but that could be useful for addressing issues, not only in North America, but in other places. So that's the, uh, that's the beginning of, of, of the book. And uh, yes, I, I can see you all find my book very pessimistic. And um, it is because I, I, I really struggle to find any, you know, uh, positive uh, features in, 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 in the situation, contemporary situation of, of asylum, refugees, and, and so on. And also because I have a structural approach 
to this phenomena. I, I hardly look at, at subjects. I did do it when I was analyzing uh, asylum in the context of uh, Chihuahua and Texas a few years ago, but because the, the, the book was requiring a more, um, you know, a wider scope of analysis, I ended up focusing on the structures and, and that's probably why Bill thinks I'm a neo-Marxist. I'm not, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not at all. I found it really, really weird that you, you, you said that. I, I look at the structures uh, through the idea of, of governmentalities rather than, uh, you know, economics, but from a necropolitical perspective and post-colonial per perspectives, even if you're looking at law or governmentalities or things like that, you have to look at capitalism. I mean, that's part of the post-colonial approach. And it doesn't mean necessarily that it's Marxist. And um, there is an approach, the, the colonial approach, which builds on neocolonial uh, economics and, and Marxism, but I don't think I'm drawing from that point of, point of view. Um, also, uh, and this has to do with, with Bill's provocations, which are really fun to address. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm very critical of liberal discourses in general, and I think that humanitarian discourses, even if they're critical, they're still very liberal in what they consider problems and, and, and so on. And from a post-structuralist, Foucauldian, or even necropolitical point of view, uh, humanitarian discourses are um, neoliberal in the sense that they're trying to um, give individuals responsibility on issues that are clearly not there. It's not theirs to bring a solution. I mean, people who have to, to, to flee their countries who are forcibly displaced because of um, economic projects and, and, and things like that, even if they want to, or, or, or they're very optimistic and so on, they, they can't stay because this is a structural problem that it's completely out of their hands. And that's what liberal discourses, including humanitarianism, escapes. I mean, they never take that in, in, into account. And I think that's the difference between liberal approaches and Marxist approaches in, in terms of, you know, post-structuralist perspectives. From this perspective, economics in terms of discourses and subjects in terms of what these discourses produce are important at the same level. So, um, I'm not addressing subjectivity, and that's why resistance is not seen in the book. But not because I, I, I think resistance is impossible, but because um, it's out of the scope of my research. I think there's always resistance, you know, for, from, from a Foucauldian point of view, power is everywhere. So every individual or every group have the possibility of, to resist what uh, the structures, gov governmentalities, and so on are doing. So I think uh, resistance is possible, but resistance is very different to, um, to change. I mean, people can resist, and, and, and I think there's lots of resistance in the caravans and lots of things that migrants and asylum seekers do, but that's different from, uh, you know, changing what's going on. I think we can resist that, but changing it, it's very, very difficult because it's out of the interest of, of you know, the, the global north, which is managing migration, and at the same time, they are producing refugees and migration and, and, and so on. Um, well, having said that, Aletia works very well with subjectivity, and, 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 and I think she mentioned
in what subjects do vis-a-vis uh, -vis this kind of a structure. So um, it's not that I don't take it into account, just that um, it's out of the scope of my research interests, if you want. Probably what I'll do next time is actually to say this, that it's not that I don't take it into account, but it's, it, it, it would be another book. And I also wanted to comment because you all um, commented on the on this concept I uh, I I didn't finish in developing in the book, which is lucrative death. I'm working on this for a, a Spanish version of this book. I mean, it's not going to be this book, but something that goes beyond in terms of, of, of conceptualizations. And I'm working on the idea of lucrative death, but as part of what I'm going to call the, the, the circular economy of migration, with the idea that people who are migrating, refugees, and so on, are not disposable, but they have um, you know, a value economic value in different parts of their of their journey. And when they are no valuable anymore, they are disposed. But that's at the end. They they bring money to um, legal and illegal economies. You know, there's a lot of markets and, and, and things that develop around migration and refugees. So they can be you know, trafficked or they can be smuggled. They can also be slaved or, or, or kidnapped or you know, lots of things that bring money to both legal and illegal economies. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the circular economy of migration, trying to bring an analogy to the circular economy of things like aluminum. Aluminium is one of the most uh, recyclable uh, uh, metals in, 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 in the world. So I think migration is a bit like that. I mean, it's the aluminium of the, <laughs> of the, 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 the human um, mobility. So it's an unfinished idea, this of, of lucrative death in the book because I tried to do something first, but the editor didn't like it. So I'm trying to, to do it differently with different analogies and, and, and things like that. But I, I think, don't remember who of you commented on, on that, but yes, they, they, there's a moment when there are no um, profitable anymore. And, and that's when, when they end up in, in disposability pockets or when they're killed or when their, their organs are used uh, for, you know, trafficking and, and, and so on. So yes, that, this is an unfinished idea. And thank you very much for highlighting that because uh, it, it, it reaffirms the idea in me that I have to, to develop it more in order to it to make sense and and and, and have a, a, a contribution on how we think of migrants as, as commodities or disposable subjects and so on. There's a lot of literature on that. And I think there's um we need to 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 bring markets into this analysis, illegal and legal. So thank you very much for commenting on on that. And uh, thank you very much for your comments and uh, everything. So um, I think I address everything. If not, just let me know and we can talk further on this. I, I, I'm curious about Daniel's questions and, 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 and what he has to, to ask me. So please. Yeah, is, is, is that okay, Dr. Fernandez, if I pull some questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so kind of just to sum up some of my comments from earlier, um, you know, it seems like necro, necro, uh, necropolitical production and management are, are central to uh, the theoretical framework. Specifically, you argue that forced migration as, as opposed to emigration or immigration is, quote, the process of becoming 
and being a person in transit in exile as a consequence of being at the center of the apparatus of forced migration, uh, neo, uh, necropolitical production and management, right? So to this end, I was hoping that you could maybe answer a couple of questions that, that I was thinking through uh, after reading your book. Uh, and then I think maybe this kind of speaks to, uh, to, to uh, Bill's comment about, uh, you know, you know, forward, forward looking or, or thinking about steps moving forward, right? Is this a very, very kind of pessimistic, uh, you know, worldview, but obviously, you know, reading this, you know, I, I get overwhelmed with a sense of like, almost like, uh, you know, ho hopelessness in, to a certain extent, right? So uh, I guess my first question is, do you see this apparatus of necropolitical production and management of forced migration as a permanent feature of our increasingly globalized late modern world? Obviously, you know, our, our increasing globalized, uh, Late modern world is is a uh, is the result of contradictory logics between uh, you know ne neoliberal logics and and logic of state sovereignty, uh, but it seems like uh, this increasingly globalized world is here to stay. So, do you see this as a permanent feature of this uh, you know the, the increasingly globalized late modern world? And if not, what if anything can scholars, policymakers, NGOs, uh, states do towards this, do do to work towards dismantling these? draconian apparatuses, right? Um, so in other words, what would you recommend as practical, practical steps in moving forward? Or is the problem at this point simply too overwhelming and all-encompassing to fully address? So that's my first question. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yes, I think it's permanent unless uh, the working force, you know, migrants as workers, or specifically undocumented workers, die in a horrible epidemic like, like, we, like the one we had before. Maybe they're gonna try to, uh, um, they're gonna try to, you know, allow more people in the global north. But otherwise, I think it's permanent in the sense that the global north doesn't want poor, racialized migrants from the third world. And because it's the global North who is in charge of managing migration through international organizations such as the UN or, or uh, the Organization of American States or the European Union and so on, um, they're not gonna change that unless there's an economic need for it. So uh, I do think that. Um, in terms of what we can do, I think that we people who, who research and analyze migration are not looking at the, 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 the right places for change. I mean, we're looking at how we have to handle um, flows or people you know, uh, migration policy, migration laws, how to handle refugees and so on. And I think what we have to do if we want change is to focus on environmental and, and economic policy. What do we do for people from Honduras or Venezuela not to emigrate? That's what we have to do. I mean, only if they stop, you know, with the degradation of the environment or, uh, you know, taking all the, the, the resources of, of, of poor countries. And I, I'm, I'm thinking in the case of Venezuela. Venezuela is in the, in, in the situation it is, yes, because authoritarian politics and yes, because of, of, of illegal uh, mining and so on, but also because there's always countries from the global north willing to buy from, uh, from criminals or uh, managing um, mining projects. And I'm talking about the Canadians in Venezuela or the World Bank in Honduras and so on. So if we as, as scholars uh, focusing on migration want to have a political activity in this, in trying to prevent or, ch or, or change the situation, I think the focus sh shouldn't be people or how we, manage them or how we look at them in terms of you know humanitarian or human rights subjects that we just help not to die when they're trying to cross a desert but we have to focus on how we could prevent the world bank from carrying on doing this these um development projects or how we stop 
you know, the degradation of, of the environment in the Pacific Islands and, and so on. That, that's if we really want to do something because I really don't think the problem has to do with policy or, or law. I think they're more part of the problem than the solution. So if, if, you push, if you push me to find something optimistic or, 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 or possibility for change, I'd say it's, it, it, it should be uh, structural rather than a uh, um, micro policy or legal approach. But then I look more Marxist and that worries me. <laughs> no, that's, uh, well, that, that would be it. Thank you, Daniel, for your, your, your questions. Really made, made me think more clearly about this. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some comments and some questions. I'll start with the uh, comments. Congratulations. Gabriela Sarkis, un gran trabajo de la doctora Esteves. Felicidades al panel. Sarina Bautista, muchas felicidades, doctora Esteves. Mariel Bustamante, this was amazing. We'll watch the rest later. Gracias a todos. Congrats on the book. Looking forward to forwarding to reading it. Robin Reinke, this was great. Many thanks to all. So I see that we have students from the Human Rights Practice Program at the University of Arizona and also from UNAM. And that's, that's always uh, excellent to have our students with us. Um, there are two questions. One is from Fernanda. Um, she says, it is evident that necropolitics in the implementation of Title 42 and the MPP in the northern border. Do you think that national and international organizations are complicit in this policy and how to avoid it? And the second question is mine, because I wanted, I, I think I just mentioned it very briefly when I, I comment on, on the book, that you talk in the book about the human rights discourse as a truth regime. So I would like to ask you if you could comment a bit more on how does it work, human rights discourse as a truth regime? What does that mean? And also you are very critical in the book explaining that this regime has clear effects in a context where human rights violations are perpetrated by state and non-state actors. So I think, I know it's a big question, but I, 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 it's part of, of one of them. There are many very interesting um, elements to discuss in that book, but I, I would like to, if you can uh, go further on this, uh, on this case, so our, our public can know that you also discuss from the international law perspective, this human rights discourse. Thank you, Ariadna. And if there are more questions, please just send them by chat. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for this question. It's, um, uh, I'm very passionate about, uh, about this because I, I used to study human rights from a very uh, positive, optimistic point of view, and I became a, a human rights former smoker. I, I, you know, when people quit smoking, it's like they don't want to see cigarettes anymore in their life. That's kind of what happened to me regarding human rights when, when, when I'm, um, when I'm analyzing uh, migration and, 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 and asylum, after becoming very critical of, of, of the law and liberal discourses, what I refer to as a true regime when talking about human rights is that it establishes um, you know, parameters and limits of what a human rights violation should be. So in terms of, of, uh, of human rights law, international or, or, or domestic or, or whatever, you have a human rights violation only if the state is involved, you know, a state agent, a military, a police officer, um, bureaucrat, whatever, but it has to, to, to have a, a state um, affiliation. Um, what we're seeing today is that people who suffer from uh, persecution not necessarily suffer persecution from a state agent, or it's not clear that the state, the, that this agent who's persecuting someone uh, has a state affiliation. And I think of, you know, people from um, uh, drug cartels, 
it's uh, well, when I analyze cases of, of Mexicans seeking asylum in the States, it was, you know, people who, who work as police officers or military during the day and during the night, they were, uh, you know, wearing masks and so on, working for the cartels. So it's not clear anymore that uh, someone is a criminal or someone is a state agent. And usually, at least in the Mexican case, um, they could be both. But in terms of asylum law, people have to prove that uh, these people have a, a, a step or, or, or have, uh, you know, that state doesn't, um, doesn't provide um, protection for this person. Or, or, or I can't remember the term in English or, or how to pronounce this, acquiescence, you know, that the state is allowing someone to persecute someone else. So that's why I refer to human rights, um, you know, like uh, through this course, they establish this on, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, when you have um, this kind of, uh, of, you know, discourse that establishes what's something and what's not, it's completely useless for, say, asylum. And then it's used only to prevent people from being, you know, um, abused by the police. Uh, let me put that example. I mean, from a human rights point of view, it's okay that states deport people through things like the 42 uh, principle article, I can't remember what it is. That's not wrong from, from a human rights point of view. What's wrong from a human rights point of view is that these people are beaten by the police or that th these people are discriminated or these people are you know, somehow physically abused or they don't have uh, uh, the right to a phone call when they are detained in a detention center and so on. So human rights discourses become just a way to have people to have people deported with a humanitarian, in a humanitarian way, but they are still deported. So that's the problem with human rights discourses. They are useless for what we need them, you know, like trying to get asylum and, and, and refugee status for people, but they are used to legitimize things like uh, massive deportations and, and so on. So they have become part of the problem, part of the um, necropolitical management of forced migration among other things, because they don't prevent that people are deported or they don't help people to get asylum. They are used to get people deported and uh, not getting asylum from a humanitarian point of view. Not sure if it was clear enough. Thank you, Ariadna, I think, I think you were. There was this other question about, uh, it, is not, it is evident that necropolitics in the implementation of Title 42. Um, and there is another question that is by Gabriela Sarkis. She asks, um, could third and fourth generation human rights add to the structural changes you propose? You mean like economic, social, cultural rights and environmental rights? Um, I don't think so because this, this are always been like, you know, the, there's, most people don't think these are rights to start with. So in the US, they don't recognize social rights as proper rights. I mean, that's, um, well, the state doesn't provide health services to start with for, you know, its citizens. So it wouldn't do it for asylum seekers and, and, and so on because they are not considered rights. 
and environmental rights. I mean, you, you could have a, you know, a march or, or, or something for environmental rights, and they are okay in paper, but as far as I'm concerned, they never, um, they, they never been useful to stop environmental degradation. So they've been there for decades and, and, and they are not even considered real rights. Not that I don't consider them to be real rights. Of course I do. But politically, it's very difficult to, to, you know, to have them enforced. And it has to do also with the fact that the, the, the background in asylum and, and refugee as, as social phenomenon, it's the it's economics, the um, development projects, um, mining, fracking, and, and so on. So economic and social rights and environmental rights are not going to make a, dif a, a difference in this at all because they they are in any case. Um, individual rights and, and, and we have a massive structural problem. But I also think um, they've never been useful for anything. I'm, I'm a, a bit pessimistic about human rights discourses as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. There is one comment. Luis Carmona, extraordinary presentation. Mil gracias. And Dan Martinez has also another question. So one other quick question. Thank you. This is this is excellent. It's given me so much to think about. Uh, so here at the University of Arizona, I teach an advanced undergraduate course on transnational crime, and we focus on this course from the perspective of trans transnational crime being rooted in global inequality rather than from a security standpoint, right? I think securitization has been done quite a bit, and I don't necessarily want to engage in that. So I tend to focus more on uh, transnational crime and global inequality. And to that end, we spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about this concept of the rule of law. And obviously, we, you know, we can be very critical as a critical scholar. I'm very, very critical of this concept of the rule of law. And, you know, kind of I'm very aware of the kind of liberal and neoliberal logics that, that play into that. Um, but at the same time, we know that, for instance, in Mexico, we have, and I say we because I'm, I'm Chilango, I was born in Mexico City and came to the U.S. as a little kid. In Mexico, we have one of the highest levels of, or one of the lowest levels of rule of law in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, particularly, uh, one of those, those, one of the components of rule of law is the absence of corruption. And in the Western Hemisphere, we actually score lowest when it comes to uh, absence of corruption, right? So, uh, and we know that corruption uh, of state, state officials in particular plays a notable role in necropolitical production and management of forced migration, particularly as it relates to lucrative death. So I was wondering if you could maybe comment on, you know, again, uh, if you see any tension there between concepts such as, you know, institution building, rule of law, uh, equitable criminal justice systems, absence of corruption on the one hand, and some of the criticisms that we've levied, uh, you know, against that idea, that concept, and then the, the on the ground reality that we see corruption of state officials playing a really important, notable role as it relates to lucrative death. I was just wondering if you have any comments or thoughts on that, uh, whether or not rule of law is something that we should be thinking about, focusing on, or are we just reproducing some of those liberal logics? Thank you. Uh, I think they're focusing on the rule of law um, or this, we, we, we have this for decades, the uh, discurso de la legalidad. You know, it, it's a kind of, requirement for policy change attached to some um, you know funding through programs such as Iniciativa Merida and, and, and so on and not only um, civil organizations such as you know Soros, Ford and so on they also give this money to to NGOs attached to develop this kind of the culture of legality. And we've been doing that for like 20 years and nothing has changed. And well, nothing has changed in terms of what kind of things occur. And I think we focus too much on that rather than thinking how, you know, these things occur through legal means. I want to think 
how much um, corruption or, or criminal activities are around deportations or around um, uh, detention centers, for instance. We, we are very aware that when lots of people from gangs in LA or, 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 or other places were deported to, to El Salvador, that's where all this Mara violence occurred. So I think that that's not the main problem. I really think that lots of, of corruption occur through the law. I mean, through the law enforcement in the US or, or things like, you, you, you must remember when this truck was found with dozens of migrants uh, who died within it. And it was in American soil. So who allowed them to, to enter American territory? I mean, it wasn't in Mexico. They managed to go through a, a, a migration point and pass a, how, how you call it, one as well. Um, you customs. Know, customs, yeah. Managed to, to, to go through customs and, and, and things like that. So there's lots of going on there in terms of corruption. Who's, that, that seem to be illegal. We are not look, but we don't look at them because we are too focused on how the poor third world countries always do things wrong, illegal, and, and they, they are corrupt and, and, and they are beyond help. So I, I really think that when we analyze crime now, we have to look at how all these things occur or how there's a, a criminal market through legal means. I'm, I'm, well, that's part of my new project as well. How you have, you know, there's all this American policy for forbidding drugs and, and illegal migration and so on, but drug traffickers, smugglers, traffickers, and all kinds of, you know, illegal markets use the same routes from the Asia, Africa, through South America, Central America, Mexico, to the US. They're exactly the same routes. You know, this, the same people who traffic drugs traffic on people. And there's lots of uh, institutional um, arrangements allowing for this to happen. So I think we have to look a bit more on how institutions and how apparently legal um, things allow for all this to happen, you know, the, 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 the op to, to do the opposite question, maybe. So how, how is it possible that you have this incredible apparatus for migration control and still you have people who died in a truck in American soil? How could that happen? And that's because we, we were aware of that one, but it must occur on a regular basis, I'm sure. So uh, yes, I, I that, that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, and I think uh, if you're teaching this kind of, of thing, probably probably posing different questions could you know go somewhere else, probably. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I absolutely, you know, I agree with you. And, you know, obviously we know that, for instance, when it comes to drug trafficking, the majority of shipments are, are passed through official ports of entry, right? So we know that people are on, you know, we know that they're corrupt CBP officials, people on the take. Uh, we know that every year dozens of, of uh, CBP officials and other law enforcement uh, entities here in the United States uh, are investigated for corruption. So corruption is clearly playing a notable role. And I completely agree that we tend to focus more on, uh, you know, issues in, you know, in what we would call, you know, third, quote unquote, third world countries rather than what's going on in the in, in the U.S. So maybe the this concept of rule of law is too insular, focusing on individual level countries rather than focusing more, more on a, a broader system, uh, as, as you might suggest. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you both. Um, I think we don't have any more questions. Um, we have a lot of comments. Uh, congratulations on this amazing book presentation and reflections around it by Miriam Aparicio. As a student, it gives me an introduction to several concepts and questions related to forced migration. Um, so I think um, we are... Uh,
Yes. I, I just uh, would like to, to share the link to, if someone is interested in buying the book, uh, I'm attaching the, the link to the, um, to the publisher and they gave me um, a flyer for uh, this 30% discount for people who's interested in buying the book. So if they use this code that I put in the, in, in the chat, but I don't, I'm not sure if everyone sees that. So if they do, they, and they are interested, they can buy it. So thank you very much for. Thank you, Ariadna. Yes, I, uh, well, people who are connected uh, the Zoom, they can see the code. And if you allow us, we can send also the code to the people that are watching us via Facebook. Is that OK? Yes. OK. Yes, thank, thank you very much. And thank you all for, for your insightful comments and feedback on, on my book and applying it to the cases you're uh, researching. It made me think a lot. Of the, the, the Virginia case is always very uh, you know, is one of the cases outside this region. So thank you very much, Bill, thank Alessia, you. and Daniel. For thank you, Ariadna. Congratulations on this book. And as I just said, when I started my comments that, you know, you're reading a good book when you have more questions and when you make us think in another way of our own research. So we really recommend to uh, buy Ariadna's book. Uh, I hope that University of Arizona Maybe the library, we can ask for them to buy it so it can be um, uh, uh, available for all our students as well as at UNAM. Thank you. And I will give uh, the, 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 I will open the floor for Luis Coronado, who is one of the organ, um, organizers, academic, and um, yeah, like the one who is in charge in terms of administration and academic administration of our consortium. We have this very important uh, consortium between UNAM and Arizona. That's how we met, that's how we work together and we keep working. So thank you, Luis, for your support. And please, could you uh, give us the final remarks to close the event? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Aletia. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, of uh, talking to you all and being part of this um, amazing event. I really want to recognize the efforts of uh, Dr. Uh, Elena Centeno and Dr. Arnoldo Bautista for organizing and, and you know doing the first initiative to bring together uh, along with uh, Dr. Aletia Fernandez de la Reguera. I really appreciate this, uh, you know, keeping all these uh, collaborations that started a few years ago and keeping them going on uh, and bringing together uh, such an amazing scholars working on topics that are related one to the other. Uh, I really want to thank also the consortium of uh, uh, UNAM UFA on migration, human rights, and human security. This is a this is an effort, a joint effort between uh, our two institutions that have been uh, bringing together centers, institutes, uh, faculty members, students, uh, working along these uh, central key concepts of our century. And our times. So I'm I'm very glad to see that uh, you know that seed that planted uh, we planted a few years ago is is giving more fruits now. And and we see you remember uh, when we started, uh, many of us were unconnected. And the main reason for this consortium to be alive is bringing together people and raising the voices of academia and organizations towards uh, these fundamental issues of the humanity in our time, which is basically these uh, processes, these complex processes of human migration, and also looking around, uh, you know, the observance of human rights and also, you know, making uh, thoughtful crit uh, critiques on, uh, uh, criticism on, on the way states uh, actually operate 
uh, in terms of making human rights available for everyone. And also human security, which is one of the fundamental concepts that Burst basically you know, criticizes the, uh, the center state approach to manage migration and to, to manage human rights. So I really appreciate uh, the Center for uh, uh, Studies of North America, uh, CISAN, and also the great leadership of, uh, of the Institute of Legal Research uh, of UNAM that is represented by Aletia in, in this uh, three branch organization of the consortium. And definitely to all the institutions who have been um, you know, putting together these presentations. I really, um, I don't have uh, so many uh, you know, new ideas. I, I am really fascinated with the different uh, lenses and questions raised um, by our scholars here in this panel. I just uh, wanted to share just briefly uh, some ideas about, you know, how um, this is these connections coming from quantitative research and qualitative research can enrich our approach to migration. And I really congratulate uh, Professor Ariadne Steves for her work and also, you know, the insights from um, Bill Simmons and Daniel, Dan Martinez also around these, uh, these issues. I just remind one of the phrases, uh, the Protestant people uh, against the, you know, this uh, basically the separation, right? Uh, uh, the uh, disappearance of uh, the 43 students in Guerrero, right? In Ayotzinapa. I remember the protesters used to say, used to call the state a narco state. So what this book reminds me is how complex are the relationship between you know, the rule of law, the state, but also uh, those who are part of the, you know, under, um, under law enforcement, right? Because in that case specifically, we, rem we remember the state saying, just, you know, there was a narco problem. It was a narco group taking and uh, taking these students, but who handled those students to the narco group? The state was participating at some of the levels of, of, of the authority in the state of Guerrero. So it's there, it's a lot of work to do still to uh to bring together many perspectives to you know making clearer scenarios to, to explain this massive disappearance of people and also this uh, humanitarian crisis that is forcing people to move from their homes to another to other places uh, trying to find better options for their life. So I think it's a very complex issue and I really appreciate all the contributions this book uh, makes uh, to, to this discussion. And I invite our scholars from the two universities and more universities in Mexico who are working on similar topics regionally or from different places around the world to look at the work of uh, the consortium of U of A UNAM on migration, human rights, and human security. Thank you so much to everyone. I just don't want to take more time, but I really, really appreciate uh, this space and this effort uh, that has brought been uh, brought together by uh, UNAM and UNAM Tucson. Thank you very much and congratulations to all the presenters. Thank you, Luis. Um, so uh, they were asking in the chat for the code again, so I think it's back in the chat. Uh, thank you, Luis, for your, for your insights on the importance of this consortium and the work that we've been doing and will keep doing. So I hope we have more presentations like this, more interaction between our scholars in both universities. Thank you all. And um, Ariadna, congratulations on this great book. We hope that many people get to read it and to learn from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, you all. And thank you, University of Arizona, UNAM, eh, Juridica, Cisan, and Sudimer for uh, organizing this amazing presentation. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all, Bill, Daniel, Luis, Dr. Elena Centeno, Arnoldo, everyone. Uh, have a good day. And